All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So this morning we're going to be in Acts chapter 26, continuing our series through the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 26. So if you want to go ahead and open up to Acts chapter 26, we'll get some music and then we'll jump into it. of God. Welcome to Life for God Ministries, where we try to glorify God in all that we do. We try to spread the word to as many people as we can. We try to help in any way that we can, any one that we can. We try to be in the night, standing in the gap to bring God's word. We truly appreciate you being with us today. And if there is anything that we can pray for, we ask that you just reach out to us. Reach out to us through text, through email, through messaging, and any way that you can get hold of us. Let us know how we can be in the night.
All right. So if you'll bow your heads with me, we'll go ahead and open up with a prayer, and then we'll jump into chapter 26 of Acts. Dear Lord, we just come to you right now, Lord, and we ask that you just bless this day, Lord. We ask that you bless this message. Lord, we thank you for all that you have provided. We, we thank you for all that you continue to do for each and every one of us, Lord. And we just ask that you bless this message and let it be your words. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, chapter 26. <clears throat> so we talked in chapter 25, and if you didn't watch cha the chapter 25 uh, episode, go back and watch the chapter 25 because we talked a little bit about who King Agrippa and Bernice and Festus and Felix and how they were all related. So we, we explained that in chapter 25. Uh, we explained that Paul is going to be talking before King Agrippa. He's going to be talking in front of King Agrippa and Bernice and Festus. Um, we've talked about who Festus was. We've talked about who King Agrippa was. We've talked about who Bernice was in the previous episodes. If you haven't watched those, go back and watch those as well. So in chapter 26, we've got Paul standing in front of King Agrippa. And Agrippa says to Paul, it's permitted for you to speak for yourself. So he's giving Paul the opportunity to, to speak. He's giving Paul the opportunity to, to give a defense. Now, again, we've talked about this. King Agrippa wasn't there to pass a judgment on Paul. He was there to listen to what Paul had to say so that Festus could then write to Caesar about why he was sending Paul to him. Because Festus didn't want to send a prisoner to Caesar without any kind of explanation as to why this guy was in front of Caesar now. That, that would be a bad day if you just send somebody to Caesar without an explanation. And Festus didn't have one, so he's asked King Agrippa to listen to Paul to give an explanation as to why this guy is going before Caesar. <clears throat> so Agrippa says, okay, talk. So it says in a... In the second part of verse 1, he said, it says, Then Paul stretched out his hand and began his defense. He says, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that today I am going to make a defense before you about everything I am accused of by the Jews, especially since you are an expert in all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. King Agrippa and Bernice were raised in the Jewish faith. They knew all the customs. They knew all the different controversies. They knew all these different things. And King Agrippa had tried to help the Jews in, with the Roman government before. So he's telling King Agrippa, I'm glad that I'm talking to you because you're going to understand some of what I'm saying here. You're going you're gonna to understand what I'm saying. He says, I beg you to listen to me patiently. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit, and I'm going to explain some things to you. And I'm just asking that you listen patiently. That's all I can ask. Just be patient as I go through the, all this. He says, all the Jews, this is Paul talking still in verse 4. He says, all the Jews know my way of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem. They had previously known me for quite some time, if they were willing to testify. That according to the strictest party of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. I was, a, he's basically, I lived among them. I was a Pharisee from the time of my youth. They knew me, and if they would just testify that they knew that I grew up as a Pharisee, and that I followed all of this as a Pharisee, there would be a little more understanding here. Because I grew up as a Pharisee. I know all the things that the Pharisees teach. I grew up with this. And they all knew me. He says, and now, in verse 6, and now I stand on trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promise our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve him night and day. King Agrippa, I am being accused by the Jews because of this hope. He says, there's a hope. And, and even through the Old Testament, even through all of the things that the Jews preach, through all of the things that the Pharisees teach, there is a hope. 
and a promise that is made. And because I cling to that hope, because I, I'm giving them and showing them what that answer to the promise was and is, because of that, I'm being persecuted. Because the hope came in human flesh, and I'm telling them about the hope and the promise that came in human flesh, because of that, I'm being persecuted. But even they, even the Pharisees preach about a promise and a hope. And the 12 tribes of Judah, the 12 tribes are, are, are going and earnestly trying to serve God and, and preach about the hope that will come. Well, I'm telling you, it came in human flesh form. And because of that, I'm being persecuted. He says in verse 8, why is it considered incredible by any of you? That God raises the dead. See, he's going now, he's saying, look, you're, you're persecuting me and you're accusing me because I say that Jesus rose from the dead. That's the whole point of all of it, is that you're persecuting me because I say that Jesus was the Messiah and Jesus rose from the dead. That's where all of this stems from. But why is that so incredible to you? Why is that incredible to you? In fact, in verse 9, he says, In fact, I myself supposed it was necessary to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus and Nazarene. I actually did this in Jerusalem, and I locked up many of the saints in prison since I had received authority from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. In all the synagogues, I often tried to make them blaspheme by punishing them. I even pursued them to foreign cities because I was greatly enraged at them. He says, look, I did all this. I was once just like them. I did exactly the same thing. I did exactly the same thing. Then he goes in verse 12. He says, I was traveling. To Damascus, under these circumstances, with authority and, and a commission from the chief priests, King Agrippa, while on the road at midday, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice speaking to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you. To kick against the goads. And goads are sharp sticks used to prod animals and, and, and such like that. It's hard for you to kick against these such a sharp object like that. So in verse 15, he says, Then I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one who you, you are persecuting. We've heard this story before, but we're going to get a little different insight in here again as he's telling this. So Jesus replies, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, but get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and what I will reveal to you. I will rescue you from the people and from the Gentiles. I now send you to them to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from power of Satan to God, that by faith in me, they may receive forgiveness of sins and share among those who are sanctified. And it's interesting here, this is one of the first times that we see that Paul says that Jesus told him to go and open their eyes. Because remember what else happened to Paul there. He was blinded and had to go and had to, had to get the scales to fall from his eyes so that his eyes would be open first. A little interesting wordplay that we have there where we have Jesus sending him to open the eyes of everyone else, but first Paul's eyes had to be opened so that he could see first. So, <clears throat> verse 19, he says, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And one of the things that he says there, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. You see, the Pharisees did believe in heavenly beings. They did believe in angels. They did believe in things like that. The Sadducees did and the Pharisees did. 
And he's already said, I grew up as a Pharisee, and the Pharisees do believe in heavenly visions. They do believe in angels. They do believe in different things like that. So he says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Because, see, like I said, the Pharisees did believe in angels. They did believe in heavenly visions. They did believe in different things like that. So he's saying, I wasn't disobedient to the heavenly vision, which, by the way, you guys believe in heavenly visions, and you wouldn't be disobedient to a heavenly vision either, right? He says, instead, I preached to those in Damascus first. He was on his road on the way to Damascus. So he says, I preached to those in Damascus first, and to those in Jerusalem, and all the region of Judea, and to the Gentiles, that they should receive, and that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple complex and were trying to kill me. To this very day, I have obtained help that comes from God. And it says, and I stand and testify to both small and great, saying nothing else than what the prophets and Moses said would take place. That the Messiah must suffer. And that as the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. You guys are, are accusing me and persecuting me because I'm saying that Jesus was the Messiah um, and Jesus rose from the dead. But I've said nothing that the prophets and Moses didn't already say. Nothing that, 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 that from was coming out of my mouth. Nothing coming out of my mouth wasn't, wasn't what the prophets and Moses already wrote and told us about. There's nothing about this that Moses and the prophets didn't already tell us about. Moses and the prophets in all the Old Testament, what do you think all of that's talking about? What do you think all of that is talking to? What do you think it's all leading up to? And I'm on trial because of that? So, in verse 24, he says, As he was making his defense this way, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice, You're out of your mind, Paul! Too much study is driving you mad! So we've got good old Festus, who's who's accusing Paul now of being insane. You're out of your mind. You you're, you don't know what you're talking about. You you've been studying so much that you're going out of your mind. You know so much that you're losing your mind. You've studied so much that you're losing your mind. Well, um, it doesn't quite work that way, does it? We as we study and look into the Bible, we learn more and more is revealed to us as we get in touch with God's word. Not you lose your mind. So Paul replies, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. On the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth and good judgment. For the king knows about these matters. It is to him I'm actually speaking boldly. That is a very polite way of saying, I wasn't talking to you. I wasn't talking to you. That's a very polite way that Paul is putting it, that, that, that saying, I'm not even talking to you, bro. I'm done talking to you. I was actually talking to him. I don't know what you're talking about. I wasn't talking to you. He says, I'm not out of my mind. I was at, the king knows about this. You don't. Uh, I wasn't talking to you. Uh, but I was talking to King Agrippa. So you over there, me and him are having a conversation. He says, for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his notice. Since this was not done in a corner. I wasn't over here in a corner talking quietly. I was going and speaking boldly. I wasn't. This was all done out in the open. So I know that he already knows about most of this. He says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? He, he's talking directly to King Agrippa, and he's looking at this guy who grew up in a Jewish home. And he looks at him directly in the face and says, do you believe the prophets? Do you believe what you grow, grew up learning? Do you, do you believe the prophets that wrote all of the Old Testament? Do you believe that? Do you believe what they said? 
He says, I know you believe. I know you believe that. So then Agrippa said to Paul in verse 28, are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? So even at this point, even Agrippa is sitting there going, man, this guy's making too much sense. Are you gonna? Are you really gonna persuade me to be a Christian just like that? Like that? Agrippa's kind of on the fence here now. He, he's 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 listening to what Paul is saying and it's making sense to him. And Paul says, "I wish before God." And this is this is so. I love this verse here, verse twenty nine. I wish before God, replied Paul that whether easily or with difficulty, not only you, but all who listen to me today might become as I am, except for these chains. I wish that all of you listening would become Christian if you're not already, would, be, would, would follow and, and follow Christ like I'm doing, except for some of the things that I do wrong, except for some of the chains that still wrap around me. That verse 29 of Acts 26 is one of the most, I think, it's just such a powerful message there. He says, whether it be easily or difficult, because some people are going to take a little bit longer. Some people is going to be a little bit longer of a process. Some people is going to take a little more showing. Some people is going to take some different things to show them the right way. Whether it be easily or whether it be with great difficulty, I wish that all of you would follow Christ. Not me. Follow Christ. So he says that. Verse 30, it says, so the king, the governor, Bernice, and those sitting with them got up. And when they left, they talked with each other and said, this man, this man is doing nothing that deserves death or chains. So everyone there, everyone there says, this man's not done anything that deserves punishment, really. And this is where, you remember I talked about and we've been talking about, you know, when Paul appealed to Caesar, a lot of people think that that was a mistake. This is why. Verse 32 of Acts chapter 26. Then Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. A lot of people think that Paul messed up when he appealed to Caesar because King Agrippa says he could have been released had he not appealed to Caesar. However, would, would the Jews have stopped? Because he had already gone before so many different courts and so many different people at the point whenever he appealed to Caesar. Would the Pharisees and Sadducees have stopped at that point? If King Agrippa right here if King Agrippa set Paul free, King Agrippa, Bernice, Festus, they set Paul free, would the Pharisees and Sadducees have stopped? No. So did Paul make a mistake by appealing to Caesar? Look, I don't know. But I can tell you, I don't disagree with what he did there. It wasn't going to stop, and it needed to go all the way up to the top. And Paul is therefore. The part that I think is not a mistake is Paul is therefore going before all of these very important top of the ladder Roman officials. And he is testifying and giving his testimony and preaching and sharing the gospel in front of all of these people. Boldly. Without fear. So was it a mistake that Paul appealed to Caesar? I don't think so. I don't think so because at the very least, he's sharing his testimony and he's sharing the good news 
before all of these high ranking Roman officials, all the way up to Caesar himself. All the way up, starting with governors, two governors, starting with governors, a king, the king's sister slash girlfriend, whatever, Bernice, all the way up to Caesar. And that's going to change a lot whenever they hear how Paul is doing this and what Paul is doing here. At the very least, even if they don't fully believe everything that Paul says and does, at the very least, it sets it up so that next time that someone is brought in there and they go, man, you know, we heard this guy, Paul, and you know, he actually made a lot of sense. So it's, it changes and it plants a seed. It's planting the seed regardless of anything else. Now, in today's world, would you, and this is a rhetorical question, would you have the faith? Would you have the boldness? Would you have the strength to stand before the president, the prime minister, whatever? That is accusing you and, and, and can put you to death for saying Jesus' name. Would you have the strength? Would you have the power? Would you have that within you? Or would you cave? Would you say, I appeal, you're you're being you're being persecuted in your town. You go to the town, the town, you know, before the city council. City council sends you up to the mayor. The mayor sends you over to the, the governor. You go from the governor up on up. Would you then, after you talk to the governor, say, I appeal to, pres to the president? Would you go and stand before president and says, I will kill you for speaking the name of Jesus? Would you go before that president and tell him about Jesus? That is what Paul did. That is what Paul did. Multiple times. And that is the strength and that is the power that we need to know that is in us as well. Paul tells us quite frankly and quite clearly that he was given the strength. That whenever he... He, he, whenever he felt like he, he, he could stop, he said, Jesus told him, no, I will give you the strength. Paul tells us that he was told that he would have the strength to continue on. We need to be more bold in talking about Jesus. We need to be more bold about it. And not be afraid of, oh, well, they may not like what I'm saying. Oh, well, they not, may not like what, what I'm saying here. And, and, you know, I can't really say anything there. And I will admit that I've done that too. Oh, well, you know, I can't really talk much about Jesus at this event because, you know, it's at a library and, you know, they, they, they just don't like that. You know what? No, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be afraid of, of saying the name of Jesus and somebody getting upset. They get upset, they get upset. That's on them, not me. I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm going to proclaim the name of Jesus. And that's it. So, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close this one out. If you'll bow your heads with me. Dear God, we just come to you right now, Lord, and we thank you for for this message, Lord, we thank you for the strength and the power and the boldness that you put in us. Lord, we know that you promised that you did not give us a spirit of fear, but one of power. And Lord, we thank you that you give us that spirit that we cannot, that, that we can go through life without being afraid, that we can proclaim you and, and glorify you without being afraid. And Lord, we just thank you for all that you continue to do for us. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So I will see you guys on Wednesday night. We have Wednesday night Bible study, 7 o'clock. 
I'm going to look at a couple of different options, but there will be, regardless of what option we go with, there will be a link posted in the group. So that way you can find it. Uh, we'll figure something out whether we continue doing on Facebook or not. There will be some sort of, uh, of a resolution to that, um, and there will be a link posted in the group. With that, I'm going to close. I'm going to go ahead and say good night or good day to you. Um, so I will see you Wednesday night, uh, Friday night at eight o'clock, Friday night lights. And then next Sunday, we'll get into chapter 27 next Sunday at 11 a.m. I love you guys and I will see you later.